Now, my own personal contribution to Austrian business cycle theory is this. Would it help the master builder out of his dilemma if, we, if he discovers that he's got not that many bricks left and then we just get him drunk? Would that actually help him? Well, in the short run, you know, he, he might be so drunk that he forgets the brick problem and he keeps on building and building. We think, hey, look, he's back to work. Isn't that great? We created jobs. But how is it good to create a job doing something that can't be done? How would that be good? Obviously, we're making the pain all the worse when we do that. And that is exactly what happened, what we've just lived through. When we lived through, first of all, the dot-com bust and, and that uh, really went bust 2000, 2001, we had precisely a situation in which instead of saying, all right, look, the economy is going to have to sort itself out, entrepreneurs are going to have to figure out where resources truly belong, now that we know we have a handle on our real resource availability, we've got to figure out what we really should be doing. Uh, we, we weren't allowed to do that. Instead, we were told, uh, no, 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 just keep on, keep at it. Because in 2001, Fed Chairman Alan Greenspan lowered interest rates 11 times. I mean, talk about, you know, the old phrase, the old saying, that when all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a, looks like a nail. Well, he's got the low interest rate hammer. I mean, he banks 11 times in 2001. So instead of people saying, we've got to restructure the economy, they just continue as before. Because the interest rates, are, are, which are supposed to serve as a break, they're supposed to be that red light, everything was green. And people just continued as before. And in fact, 2001, that was the only recession we've ever had, or, or that we have the, the data for, in which housing starts actually increased. And housing price actually increased by about 8.8% that year. So people think to themselves, wow, even in a recession, housing is strong. I guess the thing to do is to stick with housing. And so that's precisely what people did. It's the best investment you can make, right? Housing prices never go down. Does this, this sound familiar? So in other words, instead of changing their behavior, people doubled down on it. So that when the bust came, all the more people were invested in housing, in much, much more expensive houses, so the bust was even worse. In the same way that in the case of our master builder, if that bust had come early on, it would have been more moderate. But if it comes at the very end, it's a complete disaster. And so Alan Greenspan was praised as, and I'm not joking, the New York Times described him as the infallible maestro of our financial system. Really, really something. I mean, something straight out of Prava. That's the kind of comment about a mere mortal. Infallible maestro of our financial system. I mean, his former saxophone player, single-handedly, gets the economy out of recession. How did he do it? Well, by getting the master builder drunk. What's so impressive about that? He just holds on. Just, it's, it's the motto of the regime in Washington. Kick the can down the road. Never actually address your problems, just kick them down the road because some other sucker will be in charge. He can take the blame then. All right. Uh, now, it's worth noting, because I already did mention Krugman. I mean, as long as I've mentioned him, and we're all sort of agitated now because I mentioned him. Might as well stick with that theme. So one quick thing about Krugman before we go on. One of the beautiful things about the internet is that we now, I can read every Paul Krugman article that has ever been written, if for some reason I want to do that. And indeed, some people have been doing that. And one of the things they find is that in 2001, at the critical moment, what is Paul Krugman saying? We need lower interest rates to spur housing. Wellity, 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 as Homer Simpson would say. How do you like that? That's exactly the problem. And then he says, by the way, I predicted the housing bubble. Well, no kidding. You gave the very advice that caused it. I mean, no kidding. Of course you predicted it. Why is this impressive? So indeed, that's what we see. So what we see in this particular instance of, of an Austrian business cycle is that it's anything that is particularly interest rate sensitive will be artificially stimulated. And housing is interest rate sensitive for numerous reasons. It's because it's, the services of a house are stretched out over time, or the fact that we finance a house over many, many years, like a 30-year mortgage, so interest rates mean, you know, a quarter of a percent, you know, can mean $200 difference in payment, let's say. So that's a very interest rate sensitive, and so, gee, what do we get? We combine that with all the artificial inducement to house purchases that we see coming from the federal government side, and the result is, you know, is what we, what we saw. Now, what about all this, uh, this stuff about uh, lending standards, right? I mean, well, like, but didn't it occur all of a sudden that you could be a zombie? Like, you could actually be among the undead and they'd give you like a million dollar mortgage with no money down. And you could actually put zombie as your occupation and no one would say anything. Like, I mean, when did this, how did that happen? 
right? Or, or, or you're, you remember watching, you know what's weird? My wife and I watch HGTV a lot. Uh, just because there's always something that you can watch. And the other channel where there's always something on is that Food Network, but that's just murder to watch that at 11, 11 p.m. when you live in Topeka, Kansas. Oh, here in Philly, we got these awesome things. Yeah, thanks. I'm coming through that TV and committing an atrocity if you keep mentioning that. So instead, we switch on HGTV. It's so funny because at the end of each episode, you want to see what year was this one produced. Was it 2005 when it was in the midst of the bubble? Because you've got people standing there going, yeah, you know, we kind of liked the three-quarter of a million dollar house, but there was only one gazebo. You think, what, has the whole world gone insane? Like, everybody kind of went insane for this, uh, this sort of brief time. So how did this all happen? And everybody's able to get crazy mortgages. Like, what's going on? And so people say, well, you know, the federal government, uh, by means of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac and other means, uh, encouraged this. And, of course, private lenders played their own role, nobody denies that. But we also want to say that the Federal Reserve plays a role here, too. Because when the Fed increases the money supply and it gets into the hands of the banks, remember what banks want to do, the way the structure of the banking system is. They all want to lend that money out. They want to lend out as much as they can lend. Uh, well, until now. Right now, they seem fairly content to sit on a lot of money. But normally, the incentive is to lend like crazy. So when you get more money, where are you, you going to lend that ex extra money to? You have to think of yourself as being like the coach of a basketball team. And you pick out the players for your team, and then let's suppose a few minutes later you get told, oh, by the way, we changed the rules, you can pick two more players. Where are you going to get those two more players? From the pool of rejects. But I, I didn't mean that so pejorative for rejects, I'm sure they're wonderful people. I mean, from the pool of people you decided not to choose. In other words, you're going to have to choose from people whose, whose abilities are low. Because you, you already chose the best ones. Well, likewise, with the banks, they've already got everybody who would qualify at this particular interest rate. Like, they're all lent out, they're fine. So how are they going to lend out more money? They're going to have to push interest rates lower or lower their lending standards. There's no other way. So this naturally has, has this, uh, this sort of a, a effect. And there's also the fact that, let's say we didn't have a Federal Reserve System. We had a free market economy. And let's say all of us just suddenly decided we wanted to buy houses. Like, this was the cool thing. You really want to show up your friend, you know, you get two houses, then he gets three. Right? We're all just house crazy. Well, what would have happened there? Well, just as in our own situation, the price of houses would have skyrocketed. But what would also have skyrocketed, once again, would have been interest rates. Because the banks would have started to run out of money to lend, and that, the way they indicate that is, you know, it's tough to borrow now. We don't have a whole lot to lend you. And then speculators would decide, okay, I guess I, now, now I can't have five properties I have no equity in hoping that they'll gain value. I guess I won't be able to do this. I'll have to do something else. But again, if you have a central planner over money and interest rates that can push those rates down, well, I repeat myself again, but it turns all those red lights green. Then we add to that, and I, this is just to be one second, but we add to that what's sometimes called the Greenspan put, which is a, which is a, I, I wrote this article for, I gave a speech at Indiana University, and they, the spell checker, I guess, at their university changed it to Greenspan putt. Like he was a golfer. But I had, had to make that correction quickly before they make a mistake. Because if, it, I, if only he had been a golfer, it would solve a lot of our problems. Unfortunately, he was not. He was the chairman of the Federal Reserve System. And so the Greenspan put refers to this never quite articulated, obviously, policy. But uh, nevertheless, whereby a lot of market actors were of the opinion that if, if things ever went really sour, Alan Greenspan, the Federal Reserve, would be there to put things right. And so you can act, therefore, with a correspondingly increased tolerance for risk because you know that somehow, you know, the authorities have got your back and don't worry about it so much. And we see examples of that with the arrangement for the bailout of, of that uh, long-term capital management hedge fund and so on and so forth. So it's a little bit rich for Greenspan to testify before Congress that there seems to be a mysterious flaw in the free market yeah, well, I believe if you looked in the mirror, you would see that flaw, a little bit of that. Now, I will gladly take in the question uh, period, if somebody wants to ask about, well, what about, haven't we had boom-bust episodes in U.S. history before there was a Federal Reserve? You can't, you know, Greenspan isn't that old. You can't blame, you can't blame him for that. Uh, no, I mean, it is kind of sad that we can't, can't blame him for that, but... Well, what I would say is, I've, I've, I talk about this in Meltdown and then in the book that I just finished the other day, that'll come out next year, and then that's it for writing books for quite a while because I'm, I'm uh, on the verge of death after, after doing them. 
But basically what you find is that they really are caused by, by and large, the same sorts of, of phenomena. We find that, uh, for example, in the Panic of 1819, what have you got? You have the, the Bank of the United States, the, uh, the Bank of the United States, uh, uh, National Bank, or, or uh, Second Bank anyway, Second Bank of the United States, that is an inflationary bank, and, it, and all the money creation gives rise to a lot of real estate, land speculation, gets the economy on a kind of sugar high that it eventually crashes from. And people at the time said, I mean, it's, it's incredible. If you look at contemporaries in, in 1819, they say, oh, we know what caused this. It was the crazy banks. The crazy banks interfering with the market through all their money creations, obviously influences the terms of, of lending. And so a lot of people, Thomas Jefferson included, et cetera, that's it. We have to have sound money. It can't just be artificially manipulated like this to give us the phony appearance of prosperity. We need a hard money system. I mean, this not only confirmed a lot of Americans in hard money, sort of precious metal money type views, but it converted a number of Americans up to that position. And then we look throughout the 19th century, and again, we see it's the same sort of thing. There's, there's inflationary credit giving rise to an artificial boom, followed by a bust. But then secondly, we can notice, oh, here we are. So I don't know why I'm so thirsty today. Maybe, maybe it's all the airplanes. Okay, good. Um, if we look throughout the rest of the century, there's actually been a lot of very good work done recently, looking back at the 19th century, and again, identifying the causes of the fluctuations that we're seeing as being either intervention in money and banking through artificial credit, uh, or it's just the fact that you're living in an agricultural society that was going to tend to have some, a lot of supply shocks, like harvest failures. So it, it gives the impression that the economy is extremely volatile. And so then we look at the 20th century and say, it wasn't as volatile. That must be because of the Fed. Well, well no, it's because 3% of the population is farmers. We don't have that type of supply shock anymore. So you have to correct these sorts of things to make sure that you're evaluating the data carefully. We often hear the reason we needed a Federal Reserve System was we had this terrible, terrible long depression in the 1870s that went from, by some accounts, 1873 to 1879. We don't ever want to repeat that. And uh, I have kind of just a couple quick answers to that. Uh, number one is, well, we did more than repeat that with the Great Depression, which occurred under the Fed's watch. But the, it's considered impolite to raise the Great Depression against the Fed because we all know the Great Depression was just practice, okay, as, as George, as, uh, George Selkin said. So how dare we raise that? But more to the point, uh, it's interesting to note that even the New York Times, uh, breaking their unbroken hundreds of years streak, being wrong on everything, they broke that in an article a couple of years ago about the panic of, of 1873 and the 1870s Long Depression. And, and the New York Times, and I mentioned this, I'm quoting the New York Times favorably for once in my, my new book for next year, in which they say, recent research confirms there was no Long Depression of the 1870s. There was a mild, modest recession in 1873, but actually this was an extremely robust decade, production very good, uh, basically economic indicators very strong, 1880s even stronger, with, uh, with gold restored after the, uh, the Greenback experiment in the Civil War years and so on. So there actually wasn't such a thing. It, it was a part of the reason people thought there must have been uh, a long depression, which one of the reasons was that consumer prices were falling very, very rapidly every year by an average of 3.8% a year, consumer prices are falling. And we've just sort of been trained to believe that if consumer prices fall, then the Earth breaks free of its axis and spins toward the sun. But we can't have consumer prices fall. Uh, this is terrible. It leads to a, 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 a continuous deflationary spiral of death. But in fact, that doesn't seem what, it, what actually occurred. Uh, in fact, prices fell pretty consistently from 1789 to the eve of the creation of the Fed. They spiked up during wartime because then the government interferes with the banking system. But on average, they stayed about stable. And so most during peacetime, they tended to fall. People, people thought this was okay, that each year their, their money could buy more and more stuff. They, they were okay with this. That was, that people, just, people were accustomed to that. And it is indeed possible for businesses to be profitable even when the selling prices of their goods are going down every year. They can still be profitable. It just means that the factors of production that they buy to produce those goods, their prices also come down. So they still have a spread between their cost expenditures and their sales revenues. 